he wrote to Warren Buffett and got a personal response from Warren Buffett, inviting him to the Berkshire Hathaway annual general meeting. I was blown away by the story and I really want you to hear it. So, Alexi, would you like to tell us how all this happened? How did you get Warren Buffett to write to you personally? Welcome back to the Productive Insights Podcast. I'm Ash Roy, the founder of ProductiveInsights.com and the host of the Productive Insights Podcast. I'm delighted to welcome back Alexi Neoklios, who was a guest very recently on the Productive Insights Podcast, and we had a conversation about how to create compelling content by doing excellent research, excellent market research. So that conversation was all around market research and how to really understand your target audience in order to be able to create compelling content. And Alexi shared some very valuable insights. And specifically, he shared a three-pronged approach to researching your market, which you can check out at ProductiveInsights.com forward slash market hyphen research. Now, in this episode, we're going to follow up from that conversation and we're going to talk about creating a compelling offer for your market, having done that research. And we're going to focus on levels of awareness in our conversation and how you need to be aware of what level of awareness your audience is at in order to create a compelling offer for them at their level of awareness. Again, it comes back to meeting your customer where they are on their journey. Now, before we kick off into the detailed technical aspects, I wanted to just give you a bit of a background on Alexi if you haven't heard the previous episode, which I highly recommend you do. Alexi is the author of a book called Content Hacking, which I've got in my hand here, and it's a really practical book. It's got a lot of Q&A style questions right through the index, and I can just flick through the questions and jump to the relevant bits in the book. So Alexi is a very knowledgeable person. I really respect his, his knowledge and his skill. He practices as a copywriter, but his knowledge in marketing and business is, is formidable, and I highly recommend you check out the book as well as listen to this conversation. Now, Alexi is the founder of Fubi.co, spelled F-U-B-B-I dot C-O, and he has helped a company grow from $300,000 a month to $3 million a month within one year using his copywriting skills. That is the power of copywriting and having a good understanding of your target audience. Alexi believes that if you ask the right question in the right way, you can elicit a favorable response from almost anyone. And these are not just words because Alexi is about to share with us a story where he wrote to Warren Buffett and got a personal response from Warren Buffett, inviting him to the Berkshire Hathaway annual general meeting. I am a big fan of Berkshire Hathaway. I was blown away by the story and I really want you to hear it. So Alexi, would you like to tell us how all this happened. How did you get Warren Buffett to write to you personally? Yeah, so this is uh, its quite a few years ago. I think as I recall, it was 2003, 16 years ago. Yeah, 16 years ago, man, time flies. I had a bit of time on my hands and I thought, you know what, I love this guy. At the time, I had read most of the books about him, had read the vast majority of the chairman letters and, and so forth. I thought, man, this is just an awesome dude. Yes. Without really having an outcome in mind, I thought, I'm going to pop him a letter and we'll see what happens. Now, having said that, I put a lot of thought into the letter, mm-hmm. a lot of thought. So, you know, I thought to myself, you know, what is it, this, what resonates with this man? What would cut through? You know, if I was to, and really, I gave myself extremely long odds that I would even get a response, much less an invitation to the Berkshire AGM as his guest, right? So, yeah. Anyway, so let me, let me walk you through some of the thinking patterns as I can best recall them because it is 16 years ago. First thing I know about Warren Buffett is, you know, he loves money, right? <laughs> his, his financial acumen is, is off the charts. And I thought, you know what? If I attach some money to the top of this letter, there's a pretty strong chance that no one else has sent him money in the mail like that. Then I thought, well, I can attach a five buck note, I can attach a 10 buck note, I can attach a 50 buck note, a hundred dollar note. And I thought, you know what, it's pretty frugal. If I attach a hundred dollar note, that probably will reflect badly. But if it's a dollar, maybe it's a little bit too low. So I settled on 10 bucks. 
Right. But then I thought, and I knew at the time, and it's still the case, he hasn't been to Australia before. So I, was, I wrestled with, should I do an Aussie $10 note, an American $10 note? Should I get a, you know, some other currency? And I thought, you know what? Americans love Aussies. Yes. Uh, and our, our currency, as you know, is pretty colourful, certainly <laughs> compared to the, the American currency. So I attached an Aussie $10 note because it's, you know, for Americans, especially an American that hasn't been here before, there'd be even more novelty. And so this is where some of the lessons, I guess, I could impart here. Because uh, I made him an offer, you could say, if nothing else, an offer of stealing his attention. Yeah. And uh, I thought through what is going to appeal to this gentleman in a way that he's never seen before. That was really the dominant question. What can I do and say and include here that is going to be a bright spark for this guy's day? Mm -hmm. And that is the question we continue to ask to this very day for everybody that we work with, every piece of content that we create is how can this piece of content or how can this offer be a bright spark? How can there be an off the charts amount of novelty, novelty for our recipient? And, you know, it's Warren Buffett. So you know, this stuff's not easy, right? So I didn't slap this together. So there's another lesson. If the outcome is worth it, you're not going to do it quick. You're not going to like wake up at 6.30 a.m. and by 6.35 have your maximally optimal offer promise you, I promise you in five minutes, you are not going to nail it, right? Yeah. So for me, when we're talking about Warren Buffett, at least, it was a series of days and days and days of just thinking it through, cogitating, meditating, and so forth. And this isn't even me talking about what's in the letter. This right. is how is the letter going to be constructed? What's going to be at the top of the letter to get attention? And so on and so forth. So that is how I got through. Now, the envelope, I cannot recall what I did with the envelope. Like I said, it's 16 years ago. I know I put thought into the envelope. What I probably did, there's a 99% certainty. At the time, I was absorbing all of Gary Halbert's letters at the time. Uh, he was my main mentor. And at the time, and he probably to his death, uh, Gary Halbert had his A pile, B pile theory. Should I explain it or should I just move Yeah, go on? for it. Okay. So here, it was a theory of how people saw through their mail at the time. And he said, you know, you got to think it through that people sort through their mail over the wastebasket. Right. The, uh, they, and they sort their stuff in the A pile, the B pile. The A pile is, you know, a letter from the tax office or a, a, car, a greedy card from your mum, assuming you love your mother. <laughs> These are a, or you get on with your mother. These are A pile type stuff. B pile type stuff is marketing collateral. That stuff is sorted over the bin and it's chucked really quick. You want to be in the A pile. Right. And Halbert's advice was you at the time was you want to use a you want to look like a personal letter. It cannot look like marketing collateral. So if we deconstruct that, what do personal letters look like? A live postage stamp, handwritten address. There will be a personal address maybe on the returner address. In our case, and this is what we do even to this day, because we still use direct mail. We actually do not even have a return address on our letters. Right. The, reason, the reason for that is raise the curiosity level. So if you imagine you receive a letter, handwritten, postage stamp, no return address, what the heck is this? They've got no choice but to open it. It doesn't tip the hand. The singular purpose of the envelope is to get it open to read the letter. At the moment the letter or the moment the envelope is cracked and the information of the letter is, is presented, job of the envelope is done okay so odds are probably would have done that with warren buffett um but look in his case you and i both know yeah the assistant no matter what would have cracked it open she would have seen the money she would have been probably amu amused yes walked into his office in kiwi plaza however you say it and said check this out mr warren so <laughs> yeah so. yeah so man both stories the the bit about gary halbert and your story about how you thought through everything, both of them reflect a deep understanding or empathy for the recipient of the communication. And I just want to bring that out. I know you said it, but I want to reiterate that. The amount of time you would have spent thinking about how the recipient, in this case Warren Buffett, is going to receive the letter, interact with the letter, and even the assistant who's going to first open the letter, 
all of those things is the level of care and attention that needs to go into creating a compelling offer. And that's what I really wanted to bring out in this conversation. So just to finish off the story then, Alexi, what did he say in his letter to you? Ah, so the response is on my website and I've used it heaps. This reminds me what triggered the letter, in fact. An ex-girlfriend of mine who knew I was a big fan of his was living in the UK. Yes. And she excitedly called me and said, you won't believe who I just met in the UK at a bar of all places, right? This should have been my first little something's up here. I, I met Warren Buffett. I spoke to him. I told him you're a fan and so forth. So my marketing brain went, oh, I've got a trigger. So that was actually the trigger for me to send the letter. The letter opened up with, uh, you don't know me, but you know my girlfriend. She was a beautiful blonde person you met at the bar and you know, yada, yada, yada. And I think he found that amusing because in a part of what his reply was, I wasn't in the UK, never been to the UK. <laughs> I think your girlfriend met a lookalike. Um, <laughs> that, that, was, <laughs> that was in the PS of the letter that's on my website and stuff. So that's, that's what triggered the letter. That's what gave me a, an insight into, I've got, I've got my foot in the door, so to speak here, yeah. a rational sort of reason yeah to to reach out now being the cool dude that he is he still took the time to reply even Which though it's very nice of him yeah he could have easily just thought this is a ploy this guy's yeah. made this up well um, he probably on some level realized it was a ploy in a sense but he thought the amount of care and attention that's been put into this deserves a response look you know but then again it's, it's second third fourth richest man in the world so now if i was to send a letter to bill gates larry ellison jeff bezos mark zuckerberg who, I mean, what long odds would you give to yeah, a reply? Yeah. You know, they would get smashed with mail. Yeah, yeah, you know, I agree. Yeah. Nothing else. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Okay, now I've got the letter here. I found it in your book and it says, Dear Alexi, thanks for your letter. This is Warren Buffett's letter to you on December 3rd, 2003. Mr. Alexi Neoklios, I won't read the address out in case you're still living there. Dear Alexi, thanks for your letter and the enclosed $10. I'm returning the latter... <laughs> <laughs> so typical. Since I'm unlikely to be in a position to spend it, whereas you can put it to good use. Oh man, that's Buffett all the way. Unfortunately, Luana must have been attracted to a lookalike since I haven't been in London for a long time and don't e ever remember being in a bar there. I'm a bit more disappointed than she is. I'm a poor bet to ever get to Australia, but I'm keeping your letter just in case. Good luck to you. P.S. You're definitely invited to our annual general meeting next year, just as long as you bring Luana. <laughs> yeah and you can tell you can tell that he wrote that because there's the the language patterns he's a poor bet he uses that word betting a lot and the the functional utility of the 10 bucks you know you could put it to good use that's how he thinks of money it's 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 capital he's a capital allocator that's Absolutely. how he defines himself you know so you know it was pretty cool to get the response i was quite blown away frankly but it was mate i love the story i just love yeah. it you know your part in the story is as fascinating to me as his. Mm. So congratulations on that. All right. So that was an excellent story. Thank you for sharing that with us, Alexi. So now let's talk about how you created this offer and explain it in the context of our previous conversation, which was about market research. So you did your market research, you understood your target audience, and then you created an offer and you fashioned an offer that was very relevant. Can you talk through a framework that you use to create offers for your audience. And I'd like to also preface this with saying that a piece of content is, to me, an offer. It's just paid with attention rather than with money, but it's still an offer. It may be a, an offer towards the top of the funnel where someone's not ready to transact financially, but they're still paying with something. So could you tell us a little bit about your framework for creating compelling offers? Yeah, so what we'll do is I'll give you a five-part framework that is not mine. It's, it was created by somebody infinitely smarter than I, but it's the best framework that I've ever found to think through. It definitely fits to think through offers, but even more deeply to think through your audience so you can correctly conclude what offer should you make, mm -hmm. okay? And then within that, you've got how to create a great offer for that particular market. So there's sure. going to be two parts to this. So yeah. let me share it. Frameworks. Uh, just like Warren Buffett's business partner, Charlie Munger, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan, a fan of and user of mental models, mm -hmm. frameworks, and so forth. I think um, 
as filtering mechanisms to make sense of information if they're unbeatable. Yes. And so when it comes through to when it comes when it's about making offers to the market, the, the unbeatable framework as I see it is Eugene Schwartz's stages of awareness scale. So I've just grabbed this from the Active Campaign blog. This is a pretty good article on the subject. I think they've done a good job of this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do like a primer on it now. Honestly, truly, I can't overestimate, I can't overvalue the Breakthrough Advertising book mm-hmm. where this five-part scale or framework was first published. Okay. If you're in business, you need the book. Okay. It's as simple as that. If you're a copywriter or not, content creator or not, you need the book. It's expensive, unfortunately, but it's, it's going to pay so much more. So I'm going to jo- try and do justice to Gene's framework in the context of offers. So mm-hmm. here's the thing. Most people think of an offer as you give me y, X dollars, I give you Y product. Mm-hmm. True for a select segment of your audience. It is not true for the vast majority. The way you need to think of your audience is your audience is going to be broken up into five categories. Mm-hmm. And you'll see them here. You've got an unaware segment of your audience. Yep. There's going to be a problem pain aware segment of your audience there will be a segment of your audience that's focused on solutions Mm -hmm. then there'll be a segment of your a segment of your audience that is focused on product and then the most aware which is they love your product know your product and they're ready to buy let Mm -hmm. me deconstruct each of these and i'll make some sense for you for each of these sure first up the easiest to sell to start at the bottom these are the easiest to sell to, the most aware. These are people that know you, love you, want you, and all you need is, hey, I've got XYZ product, it's 50% off. That's all you need. You don't need 20 pages of copy. You don't need the webinar. You don't need the big ass pitch. In Eugene's book, he uses the example, as I recall, of Big Macs, 50% off. Right. If you're a Big Mac lover, you don't need... A, a four minute commercial about Big Macs and why you should love them and all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. 50% off is all you need. Okay. Yep. They're the easiest pitch. Next, product aware. These are people that know about your product, but they don't know how it differentiates necessarily from other options. Mm-hmm. This is where your, your content initially needs to hit and differentiate your product. The Apple iPad. Okay. Mm-hmm hyphen the world's most elegant tablet i'm making that up i don't even know that i'm an ipad user i don't even know (laughs) that would be an example where if there's a tablet war and your particular segment of that audience is looking to buy a tablet they're looking at you know looking at the ipad they're looking at whatever other options are out there Mm -hmm. the move there is but they don't yet know why an ipad over you know whatever else is out there yeah, Samsung need... Galaxy or whatever it is. Actually, you know what? I've got a, I've got a better example. About mm-hmm. four months ago, I was in the market for a new iPhone. Mm-hmm. And for the first time ever, I was um, looking at getting something else. I was considering it. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at Google Pixel and, and so, so on. And mm-hmm. something like two days after the thought entered my head, I kid you not, something a, a article pops up in my feed, Apple uh, iPhone X versus Google Pixel colon, which one is better? Mm -hmm. Perfect timing. For me, the content focused in on the unique attributes of the iPhone versus Mm -hmm. the unique attributes of the Google Pixel. Were you getting retargeted by any chance? Man, I I don't know if I did a search. I don't know. Look, I don't even know, but it was enough for me to go, how the... Holy crabola. <laughs> I, I might have searched it and forgot. Yeah, I yeah. have a suspicion I didn't, man. I have a suspicion I didn't even type it in. Right. I, 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 it's scary. We could talk about the power of Facebook another time, mate. So what I want to get across here, when you're talking about your offers, the offer you're making is a content offer. It is not a buy my stuff type offer. Mm-hmm. And at this level here, it's about differentiation of your product. Yeah. And a great example is iPhone X versus Google Pixel. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next level. Actually, let's go back a step. The only place you're making product offers, mm-hmm. buy my stuff today, is at this level. All of these other levels are content offers. Attention. 
Mm-hmm. You're fighting for attention. You're just fighting for attention in different ways. Yes. That's another way to think it through. Yes. So at Solution Aware, this is the traditional uh, out benefit-driven type content. Mm-hmm. So um, how to have glowing skin in 30 days, mm-hmm. for example. Um, how to be thin and sexy, ready for summer, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. These are all Solution Aware, outcome-focused, content-driven. This is where... You might, for example, have the long form webinar. You might have the long form video. You might have, you know, a long copy sales letter that mm-hmm. opens up with the benefits, opens mm-hmm. up with sharing content. And then as they progress through the sales piece, you're pushing them down through the awareness scale. You introduce mm-hmm. your product, you differentiate your product. You sell them on their product, they start to desire your product, and then you move into your hardcore offer to buy now. Yeah. All right. So that's solution aware. Now, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, uh, we often would do long copy letters that would push people through, down this scale to buy on the spot. Uh-huh. That is still re- relevant, more commonly with live events. Or an immersive webinar where you push them through and you ask for the sale at the end. It's lesser common nowadays with long copy letters. It's out there, lesser common. What's more common nowadays is to use and utilize retargeting frameworks. Yes. Retargeting 10 years ago wasn't a thing. Now it's much more powerful. So what you can do is have a piece of content that provides a solution Mm -hmm. that then doesn't actually immediately retarget with it doesn't immediately sorry move to a product pitch Mm -hmm. but you set up a retargeting ad Mm. that moves them into product aware that then hits them up with another retargeting ad potentially for the 50 percent off thing yeah and an active campaign you can also have site tracking which is something i talked about with barry moore in episode 177 so you can see which pages, which thank you pages people have arrived at on your page and use that to retarget. Well, now you're getting more granular. There's no doubt. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Yeah, it makes sense. If they've gone to the checkout and abandoned, you might mm. be able to go from here to here. Yeah. It's a pos- yeah. It's, and totally skip that step. And by the way, Alexi is sharing a screen as we are speaking. So if you're wondering what he means by here to here, you need to watch the video on YouTube, which you can access at productiveinsights.com forward slash YouTube. Okay, so solution aware, we've covered that. Let's move on higher up again. So for the longest time, I couldn't work out why Eugene had this before solution aware because most of my career, or for a big part of my career, I was writing benefit field headlines. Right. But then I realized this is a, a framework that we all started unaware. We always move to a problem because before you can start searching for a solution, you probably need to have a problem in mind. So your audience, some segment of it is at the problem pain aware stage. These people, your headlines, your content and so forth, doesn't offer an outcome. It hits the pain button. Hmm. Acne question mark, for Hmm. example. Hmm. Okay. Losing your hair question mark, Hmm. for example, et cetera, et cetera. You need to hit the exact dialogue that they have in their minds right now at the problem aware stage. So if they're thinking, for example, I'm just going to make this up off the top of my head, uh, looking in the mirror and they see that they've got acne on their skin Mm -hmm. and they're worried about it, then a headline such as worried about the acne on your chin, question mark, Mm -hmm. is probably going to hit the mark more often than not. I can dissect that further, but I'm gonna. I don't want to do that in this particular podcast. Uh, but just know, at this level, your content's talking about a problem. At this level, you can be absolutely doing long form webinars. You could be absolutely inviting people to events, all that sort of stuff. You are not pitching anything usually at this stage. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then what you do is, like I said, you, you start them here, then from problem you move into the solution, 
and you move them into problem where, and then obviously you make your pigeon. Okay. And then at the top of this framework is the underwear market. People that don't know what they don't know. Yeah. This is the biggest market. They are also the hardest market to sell to. And they usually will have the longest sales cycle. Right, because they're at what digital marketer calls top of the funnel. They're at top of the funnel. You could say, it, it, look, it, it doesn't exactly translate, this, this model doesn't exactly translate to the top of the funnel, middle funnel, bottom of funnel framework. Mm -hmm. It definitely relates. There's no doubt. Yeah. Um, it's, there's a bit more detail to it. But yeah, for, for the sake of our talk today, yeah. this most closely resembles top of the funnel. Okay. For sure. Because you could break up top of the funnel to be here, to be here, or to be that, right. strictly speaking. Yeah. These are people that don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So in Eugene's book, he used the example of a TV repairman. Mm -hmm. And the headline was, why haven't TV owners been told these facts? Question mark. And the offer was for a book that basically said, you don't need to have a TV repairman come out to your home to fix your TV. You could just buy this book that shows you exactly what you need to do. And instead of spending hundreds of dollars on a TV repairman, you can spend 15 bucks and get everything that you need. Right. He was trying to say that that market at that stage didn't, it weren't even aware that they could make slight adjustments to their TVs themselves. Yes. They weren't aware. That's the key to this. And that's why this market here resonates with a headline like that. It could resonate with the six, business, the six biggest mistakes that property investors make that they don't even know. It's a six biggest mistakes, seven biggest mistakes type headlines and themes for your content yeah. work at this level. The three most dangerous trends facing business owners, law firms, whatever it mm -hmm. may be. Information works at this level, yeah. stats, trends, data, all of that works at this level. That's the correct decision at this point. Yep. That is how you get on their radar. And then, like I said before, you start to steadily. Yeah. In terms of that unaware stage, I remember writing an article, a guest post. It said, how lack of sleep is killing you and your career. And that was quite popular. It got quite a strong response. Um, yeah. So there's a case to make that is at that level there. Problem awareness. Okay. Yep. Yeah. There's a case there. The way that would be unaware would be the little known silent killer that's robbing you of uh, testosterone and 10 years and stealing 10 years off your age or something, or I love it, it cause yeah. you to die prematurely. Cool. That, that is a non-compliant claim. You would never get that published anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the silent killer that's doing X, Y, and Z yeah. is more the, for the unaware. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Now, when you're producing content, when you're producing offers and so forth, yeah. here's what you want to do. It's hard to do it. Not everybody does it. Even I don't do it because of the, the efforts. Mm -hmm. You want to have your offers targeted to each of these. Okay. Each of the five <laughs> what, stages. Yep. What that means is five funnels, five lead magnets, five yada, yada, yada. Okay. Yep. Well, no, actually, four, fun, four lead magnets, five funnels. Yep. Because yep. this first one at the most aware, hmm. this here is an example of a particular subscriber being on your email list for a year, hmm. has bought some products in the past, readily, you've seen your active campaign reports, readily opens your emails, clicks through, reaches out to you via email and says, great article, loved it. You know, they're clearly, if you were to shortlist your top 50 best people, they yes. fall into that. <laughs> right. Okay. That's that right. sort of a person. Uh, now, there's a case to make. Also, probably within that person is an opt-in subscriber that has never bought but loves your content, reports in your content, you know, yes. actually opens a lot of your emails and he's just getting really, really close to buying their first product. Uh -huh. That's that sort of a person. Okay. Okay. Now, that this person here could also, that person I've just described, could also be this person too in some cases. Okay. Been on, been on your list for a while, engaged with a lot of content, 
maybe even showed up to a free event, never bought, really close to buying. Mm-hmm. These are your two easiest pitch, two easiest sales you'll ever make. Okay. So when you're building out your content and your offers, do this one first. Mm-hmm. Once you button that down, then go to this one. Yep. And then go to this one. And as you imagine the inverted pyramid with the, the apex down the bottom, yep. upwards, the market starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yep. But there is a direct relationship between complexity of selling, time of selling, cost of sale. This person here will cost you probably more to make the sale Correct. than this person here. Because the unaware person is nowhere near their buying window and yeah. the most aware person is at the buying window. Correct. Correct. Right. So when you're thinking through your offers and your content and so forth, and it's indispensable to have this framework in mind. Yes. Even when you're creating Facebook ads, you know, uh-huh. you've got retargeting frameworks that yes. you're pushing people through this, mm-hmm. you know? Keep this in mind and you won't get, if you, if you screw up, you won't get too, you won't screw up too badly. You've got something to filter your decisions through. Yes. Yeah. I agree. And I think what I like about this framework is also it helps you to zero in on putting the right offer in the right, in front of the right person at the right time on their journey. So the unaware person putting a paid offer in front of them is not the right time for them at that stage, the unaware stage they're not even aware of the problem. So the offer there should be, hey, are you aware of this problem? And then the next stage would be, now that you're aware of the problem, are you aware of the pain that this problem is causing you? And so on, through to when they're the most aware and you say, okay, we both agree that you have a problem, that you know that there is a solution, you know that there is a product, would you like to buy the product? And that's when they're in that buying window of paying for the product. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you something. If you just a little bit of common sense, you can work this out yourself. So if we consider the Big Mac that we all know. Yeah. Big Mac, 50% off to someone that's never heard of a Big Mac. Yes, I love that. Yep. It just means nothing. Nothing, right? Yep. So straight away, you know, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A Big Mac to someone who, if Big Mac 50% off that doesn't know your product but has a problem, yes. doesn't apply. What you do there is, Hungry, are you starving but have little time, perhaps, question mark, mm-hmm. right? Then you would start to segue through to introducing the Big Mac, the two patties and the three buns or whatever. Yep. And guess what? Today it's 50% off. Mm-hmm. Then we go here, solution aware. So I don't know, what, what, what's the benefit of a Big Mac? I don't eat them. <laughs> I'm actually It satisfies struggling. your hunger. There are <laughs> other consequences, but you end up feeling full. Let's put it that way. <laughs> There you go. Or it could be, it could be, uh, I, look, I don't know. I, can't even, I literally can't even think of a benefit-driven headline for a Big Mac. Let's just skip it, right? You can tell I'm a bit of a health freak. <laughs> but you can see some ads. When you see McDonald's commercials, yeah. you can see they're, they're hitting, they don't really hit unaware too often, right? Yeah. Um, they're, 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 because they've got their products front and center. But you can see like the big value packs they do, 1995 feed a whole family, Yeah. right? That's largely that, the mm. affordability thing, the quick and the, the quickness and the speed. Mum doesn't have to rush home, cook. You know, yeah. don't want to spend a bundle, no time. Get the nineteen ninety five family pack. Mm-hmm. You can see just by even looking at many of McDonald's ads, they're all naturally appealing to these various stages of awareness, depending on what they're offering. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is fantastic because this fits beautifully into a nine-step framework that I've created for my members in my membership. The first step is the research and you know market research piece, which we talked about in the last episode. And soon after that, one of the steps is to create a compelling offer. So this is, I'm going to put this, I'm going to link to this episode in that nine-step framework. Awesome. Okay, so let's talk about how you were able to create a compelling offer for one of your clients that resulted in a high profitable turnover. So when we're talking about making astoundingly strong offers for a big ticket item of a few grand or more, we we really need to ask ourselves, who is the audience? Mm -hmm. Okay, we always go back to the audience. Keeps coming back to that. Now, other things being equal. Here's what I've learned in almost two decades. Big ticket offers to audiences that are not sophisticated. 
okay? Meaning, what I mean is, let's say you want to sell a $10,000 property investing course or live event or whatever it may be mm -hmm. to people that have never bought property before. One of the things that move the dial for them is lots of stuff. Right. A big box of stuff. All right. Physical yeah. stuff. Lots of stuff. Beginners, other things being equal, will assess value based, by, based on weight. Now, I don't know if I learned that from Dan Kennedy or Gary Halbert. One of, the, well, one of those two guys said it. You want a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. The next thing, if you're selling big ticket to uh, go back a step. So what you want the stuff to be in terms of value, and this gets tough at 10 grand, you want like 10 times the value. Right. It's hard at 10 grand because it's 100 grand the value. At two grand, what we used to do if we were selling home study courses and the like, the asking price is two grand. We would create a list of bonuses, stuff, that would equate to fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars worth of value. And that could be recordings to events, that could be mm. manuals, that could be um, consulting time, certificates. They, they were always good because if you valued your time at 500 bucks an hour and you gave 10 of those, for example, there's an instant 5,000 bucks worth of value. And that has to be perceived by the customer as well. I mean, perceived value, not implying that it isn't actually worth that, but the customer must agree that that is the value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always about the client. It's always about what the client perceives. This could backfire. If you go and tack on a $500 per hour hourly rate, and you don't have any authority, you don't have any presence, you're not, you're like a, you know, you had just had, you're not there yet. You know, they're just going to laugh at you and go, dude, who are you? You know, like, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So other things being equal, beginner markets, um, uh, they like the stuff, they like the weight. 10 times is the roughly the ballpark you want to go for. At $10,000, that gets hard if that's a price point, but that's what we, we strive for. The next, if we're talking big ticket, and it's a beginner audience, the money back guarantees can be powerful, but you've got to be damn careful. Damn careful. Because what you will get is you'll offer the guarantee and people that are beginners, that are new, they're scared of just whatever they're scared of, they may not implement anything and ask for the refund. Yes. If you've gone and made guarantees of performance, mm -hmm. you can run into all sorts of legal problems there too. So what works really well with the beginner market are conditional guarantees. Mm -hmm. These are believable as well because yes. beginner markets that are buying big ticket items inherent in their, where they are right now in their own evolution and personality is they're scared of themselves. Mm -hmm. They're scared if it, the way they frame it is I'm, they're worried if the system is going to work. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, if it's a great system and we know it works, that's a lesser of an issue. Really what they're worried is about their own capacity to implement the system. Will this work for me? For me, for me. But no one ever comes out and says that. But that's it, really what they're saying silently to themselves. I remember, I think I watched this in one of the digital marketer trainings, Ryan Dice, who was on episode 170. I don't know if he said it in the episode, but it was in one of the trainings. People are often asking, will this work for me when they're actually just saying, does your system work? Yeah. That's actually what they're saying. And so with a beginner market, a conditional guarantee can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. Implement one tool from the course and if you don't get X outcome, you get a refund or whatever it may be. Yeah. It's conditional based upon at least one action on their part. Mm -hmm. What that opens the door to though, in a beginner market, again, is the performance-based outcome. This is mm -hmm. where you can start to introduce the idea of and it gets dicey with beginners, but promising outcome, engineering outcomes. Yes. Yeah. In a beginner market, and this is where I, I want to get across, and it goes ties back to the offer. Really, really compelling offers conclude the outcome for the audience. A compelling offer makes it believable and clear cut and concrete what the outcome will be for the audience. Mm hmm. This is key because if 100% of your audience knew, guaranteed 100% that 
that the outcome from spending five grand with you will be 50 grand for them or 100 grand for them or whatever the outcome is, they knew 100% we would all just buy and spend the 5,000 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. With the beginner market, we want to try and promise outcomes, but we're running into their own fear about their own situation. So the conditional guarantee works really, really well. Mm -hmm. With a much more sophisticated audience, you can start to guarantee certain outcomes. Again, you've got to be careful. Our income claims and all that sort of stuff, it's getting tougher and tougher every year. I'm just saying as part of an offer, the ultimate offer is giving the outcome. <laughs> yeah. Nothing beats that. Yeah. You're sure, you can give lots of bonuses. Sure, you can imply guarantees. All that stuff is good. But the ultimate offer is... Spend five today, get 50 sometime in the future, get 100 sometime in the future. And the best thinking on this subject that I've ever seen is Dean Jackson. I don't know Dean personally. We know many of the same people. We're like one degree of separation. What's one degree of separation? We know one person in between us, right? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. We're one degree of separation for dozens of people. I don't know if he knows that about me, but I definitely know it about him. I, I give him lots of credit because he's a, a, an awesome thinker. And he has James Tramco is one person that you know that he knows. There's one, right? Yeah. Um, and he has the best thinking on the engineering outcomes for clients. Okay. And he talks about this when you're dialing in your offer and so forth. The preeminent offer is the, is the outcome. But it's hard to do, right? Because if you just imagine, you or I, if we were on the hook to guarantee outcome for every single person that buys from us. Now, we're, we're a managed service, so we do all the content for clients. What we don't do is the distribution. Clients, uh, we, we leave it to clients to post the content, drive ads, traffic, and so forth. I always wanted to do, the, to do that for clients. The initial version of our company was all that. And then I realized we can't do everything world-class. Can't do it all world-class. It needs to, impossibility. I've never seen it. So we, and I, but I wanted to engineer the outcome. And I realized that we're not capable. So we do one part of the equation world-class. Yes. Unfortunately, we can't absolutely guarantee the outcome. So we refer to world-class people. Yes. But man, I would love to get paid for outcome only. Yes. It's just, we can't do it. Yes. Damn if it could be done. <laughs> I know what you mean, yeah. Some, there's sometimes general, genuine about, limitations. Yeah. What about delivering a uh, part of the outcome, which is what you kind of said already, but I'm just thinking in terms of the initial part of the offer. So for example, with my membership, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm giving away four, up to four hours of free sessions to founding members, and it's only $99 a month. That's not going to be able, I'm not going to be able to deliver that forever. But in that, in those four sessions in that first month, I get them a result. And then that gives them the confidence to stay with me for a year, two years, three years. I've only been doing it for six months, so I don't know how long their tenure will be. But what about delivering an epic result for a small fee initially to earn the trust and then systemizing it? Yeah, so it, it could be a viable idea. Uh, there's a few holes in that. One of those being message to market match, making sure you're working with the right people. So, Yeah, I handpick the people that I get into. Uh, yeah, so in our case, even though we don't do the distribution, even though we don't buy the ads, what I've learned through a fair bit of pain, I probably had to go through six months of pain to work this out. I wanted to do it all for everybody. Okay. Yes. Realized can't be done. So then I went, well, how do we get the outcome? And I went, well, that's really easy. Just work with clients that are right on the precipice of, I just, we just got to do one thing. And as soon as they put it out there, we get the results. So in our case, in my book, you saw the content hacking scorecard. Yes. So I think the number is 51 or 52 points. You need, a, we need, you need a minimum threshold of 51, 52 points to work with us. Now, what that means in effect usually is you've got traffic, you've got an email list, you've got a funnel, you're probably running some Facebook ads. Man, I can tell you now, I can pretty much say to you, dude, if you're doing all that, yeah. we'll get you the outcome, the ROI. In fact, I said that to two, two new clients this morning. That's a no-brainer. Happy to be to guarantee them because all they've got to do is broadcast the email. Yes. So one client so they came on last month. He's got thirty thousand emails on his list. Yeah. I said, Michael, how often do you email your list? Oh, he goes probably once a month. And Michael, that's insane. 
Dude, here's what you do. Do this first and then buy it because I know when you do this, you're going to want to spend more money with me. Send out this one nine-word email. Oh, yes. Dean Jackson's nine-word email. Yep. Here is my pred- Dean Jackson again. Dude, I'm yeah. going to hug that guy when I see him, right? <laughs> um, one nine-word email. I gave him the wording and I said, Michael, prediction, three to 400 lead. The next morning, I get an SMS, exclamation marks like all over the map. Alexi, we've got over 200 within a couple of hours. You're a genius. Yeah, like I'm a genius. I'm not a genius. Yeah. Right? Dean, that's a genius. Um, but here's the thing. I knew that the content would work because of the message to market match. So this is how we've gotten across get guaranteeing outcome, you could say, in, the, in, in these circumstances, is I see that the assets are already locked in. The, the pillars are in place with the client. And all we've got to do is great work on our end. And the moment our work gets put in front of their built-in audience, email list, big social following, traffic to the website, you know, our, our basic package is thirteen ninety-seven USD right, mm-hmm. per month. You know, if you're selling a 30 grand item or a 20 grand item or whatever it may be. That's nothing. These are the sort of situations we, look, we hunt for and yeah. look out for with clients and when we can't, when we don't have those, I'm pretty quick nowadays to call it and say, "Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I struggle to see where the ROI is going to happen from our particular services. I want to give it to you, but here's the problem." And I'll go through and say, "You don't have the funnel. You don't have traffic. No email." Yeah, yeah. I remember talking to Alana Wexler, who does Facebook ads, and that is one of the things she looks for when she works with somebody because she says, I could create the best Facebook ad for you in the world, but if you don't have a funnel to convert the ad, yeah. what's the point in doing the ad? Yeah. You know, you need to have a good landing page. You need to have a good offer. You need to have done your research. Otherwise, your ad's going to not work. Here's the thing. In a managed service context, having the discipline to say no gets easier. Mm-hmm. It really does because we get pain if we say yes to a client that we know really, you know, it's, they're not going to get our ROI from this. We get pain. It's very clear. Within a month or two, it, it's just not there. It's a lot harder with an info product. Hmm. With an info product, it's very easy to say the content's amazing, but it's up to our client to implement. Yes. It's easier to let people buy, you know, that you may make a personal assessment and say, well, the likelihood of this person actually implementing pretty low but are you responsible for that in a managed service context we definitely are because we need clients to stick and it's an ongoing relationship so it's very easy for us to be disciplined i really like amy porterfield's refund policy i really like how she does everything in business and she only gives refunds i believe if you complete the exercises in associated with the product which i think is very fair that stops the tire kickers as well if you complete the exercises, you'll get the results. So, you know. That's a conditional guarantee, which yeah. has its place certainly in an information market dealing with beginners. Now, that's going to be a decision for her. Now, she's going to have less churn, have less refunds. She'll have less complaints, less negative reviews. Yeah. There's a litany of advantages. Uh, we've got other clients that would never in a million years do the conditional guarantee, spend a million bucks a month on ads. Set, like We've got some clients that spend that much. That sell education, but they've got dozens of salespeople on the team, got to keep the sales team busy. There's big ad budgets. There's, yeah. a, there's a whole big machine. I just can't relate to that approach. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. It, it depends on the goal and the outcome. And look, it's a, deci- it's a personal decision, I guess, is sure, what I'm yeah. saying. I'd rather take the pain up front and yeah. have somebody say, no, I don't want to buy your product because I'm not willing to do the work and not buy my product, then have to go through the whole process of them buying it and then wanting to refund it afterwards. It's just a waste of time for them and me. Yeah, the decision was easier 10 years ago before the before the internet really, really, even 15 years ago, call it, right? The decision's easier now because Google rewards negative reviews. <laughs> and, you know, like if you get, if you write a negative review and you do a good job of it, it's really hard to pull that crap down. So if you've got a... Oh, I see, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 15 years ago, the, the conditional guarantee was quite uncommon, mm-hmm. quite uncommon. It has much more of a place now, truly, because yeah. a dissenting client that absolutely did not lift a finger 
for a split second to implement your stuff, who's absolutely 100% responsible, yeah, can make a big fuss in a public forum for us. It, it, big ticket, like, are we friends with Taki Moore? You yeah, yeah, like yeah. Uh, Taki's okay. been on this podcast, episode 30. Beautiful. Taki's got some very firm views on this because he's got a community. Yes. Okay. But if you're selling a $5,000 info product that is deliverables in a membership portal, there is no community and so forth, then it's a harder decision. It's not as easy because there's no community behind it. It's still easier than 10, 15 years ago because the dissenting client that didn't lift a finger, that is lazy, whatever it may be, who's 100% responsible for not getting a result, Hmm. can still cause a big ruckus on social and on Google. Yes. And that has... Look, we've got clients that actually have this happening where they just cannot get removed from Google. It's the negative. So sad. It just can't be done. It's really hard once it's up there. And it costs them genuinely is money out of their pocket. I know. I know. Yeah. You know, I'd rather just stay a small brand and be effective than, yeah. you know, be really huge. And that's one of the other disadvantages of being a really big brand because then you become a target for True. a lot of these sorts of unfair practices in my opinion okay so we've talked about how to go about creating an offer and the biggest challenges around creating an offer implicit in what you said is really not doing the research not understanding your audience well enough not understanding which stage of their buying journey they're in so i'm just going to do a quick recap and then we'll talk about action steps And then we'll talk about where people can go to get more help from you when it comes to creating an offer and or doing research. So you talked about the five stages of awareness, which is explained in the book Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz. And they are stage one is the unaware, the least likely to buy. The person who's unaware of the problem and obviously unaware of your product or your offer. The second stage is that they're aware of the problem, but they may not be aware of the solution, that the problem does have a solution that is available to them. The third stage is where they're solution aware. So they're aware of the problem, they're aware of the solution, but they're not yet aware of the product. The fourth stage is they're aware of the product as being a solution to their problem. And then the fifth stage is where they're most aware and they are most likely to buy a product because they're actually aware of your product being a solution to their problem. Have I summed that up correctly? Yeah, with product aware, so... They're aware of your product, but they're not aware that your your product is the the differentiating solution to their. Yes. To, yeah, it's a differentiating point at the problem aware stage. Gotcha. It's a unique selling point. Yeah. So the action steps to create a good quality offer is to understand where your target audience fits in that five step framework. Do a lot of research. Understand how your offer is going to solve their problem where they are on their journey a good approach in my opinion would be to check out the episode on creating an empathy map episode 117 and definitely check out the previous episode where Alexi and I talked about market research that's productiveinsights.com forward slash market hyphen research Alexi what other action steps do you recommend our listeners take to create a good quality offer yeah what, what we haven't talked about is looking at the competition so a good quality, oh, yes. yeah, a good quality offer is only relative to other options. Mm-hmm. And so if you're, 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 you know, if you're selling, I don't know, for example, let's say we're selling, I want to find something without, okay, water bottles yeah. for 10 bucks um, and you come along and you do a competitor analysis and others are selling the exact same water bottle for eight bucks. Yes. Well, your offer is pretty crappy. Yes. <laughs> so you need to do a competitor analysis. Because part of what is an amazing offer is no one else is doing it. Mm-hmm. But it's what the market sincerely craves and wants. And this is where the power of a brand comes in at the most aware. There's no other Big Mac in the world. Mm. Only McDonald's is offering the 50% off Big Mac. So when you get brand awareness happening, when you get your community, you get your audience, they love you, love you, love you, you now start to cultivate a brand. And that's one of the key investing principles that Warren Buffett uses, and that is companies that have a durable, sustainable competitive advantage, and brand is one of the big things. He calls it the moat, M-O-A-T. Yes, the moat, yes. 
That's how you could think of your email list. That's how you can think of your buyers. That's how you could think of your private Facebook group. These people that come back for more and more. Yeah. Yes. That's how you think of that. This is your moat. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, the email list was the big moat. Now, where there are so many other channels, you can't help but just think in terms of multiple platforms now. Your LinkedIn following, those that comment on your, on your content, you know, all that sort of stuff. The, this is your moat. You know, like uh, one of our biggest clients, we, um, we speak a lot, tens and tens of millions of dollars a year in sales. And we were brainstorming what would happen if uh, his email server got shut down, Facebook shut him down, like everything. And his best estimation was he would have two years of business, two years of momentum left in the engine in his company. Now, he would have to strip back people and all that sort of stuff, but two years of equity yes. built into his machinery. Yes. Um, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. Maybe it's a year, maybe it's three years, but the point is that is his moat. Now, here's the thing. Even if it got shut down, his email servers got shut down, he could definitely get those email names into another system warm some of them up. So that's doable. Um, if Facebook shut down his accounts, he's got a, a 50 other accounts. He'd find a way. Yes. What are the action steps that come out of that step? Yeah. So first you identify which stage of awareness are you going to speak to? Like I said, you can speak to all mm -hmm. five. Start with the bottom one. Think through some offers. But of course, do a competitor analysis. What other offers are people making? If you don't have a brand that is, the competitor analysis gets very important. If you do have a brand, well, you can do what the heck you want. <laughs> People that love you will buy. Yes. Yeah. Another thing to also think about, I think, is the do nothing option. So how is my solution going to be a better option than the customer doing nothing? Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. We used to use a close. Now, I don't write copy anymore, but when we used to do long copy letters, we had a close that... I always sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I always quivered a bit because it sounded so egotistical, but it was something like this. It was, um, uh, Ash, here's the thing. Uh, what I put on the table for you now is a life-changing offer. It has the potential to do this and to do that and to do the other thing. Transform the, fam the life of your family. Transform your peace of mind. Help you sleep late at night, et cetera, et cetera. For me, it's an extra grand in my pocket, an extra two grand. I'm not going to notice it either way. Think, think about that. <laughs> now, every time we did that and it worked, every time I did that, I thought, I sound like a complete <laughs> here. So does the client. And I was usually writing for a client. Man, I'll tell you now, when that's got the right delivery behind it, when you've got the status and the authority, that comes off pretty powerfully because it's true. A multi, multi, multi millionaire is not going to notice two grand. Yes. The education found in a two grand okay. product, and I know it's happened for me and probably happened for you, has changed my life. Truly. Man, once again, you've delivered amazing value to our listeners. So thank you. I really appreciate it. How do our listeners find out more about Alexi? So a few places. If you uh, have got funnels, you got some traffic, you're producing some content, but you just don't have the time to really smash it out at a higher level, um, maybe we could help you on a managed service level. So fubi.co is the place mm -hmm. to go, F-U-B-B-I dot C-O. And just lob a note in through the submission mm -hmm. form on the contact page. Mention Ash so we know that where you come from. If you're not at that level, but you just love maybe what I've shared here, you can find us on Facebook, fubi.co. Like our fan page and stuff. We publish content every single day. And definitely opt into our email list. You can do that from the website. We do currently four emails a week, five coming up. That sounds like, oh, my God, you're emailing too much. No, no, no. Everything is content. We don't pitch. We yes. don't pitch. Every 21 days, we do do a nine-word email. That is something like, do you need help with content? Otherwise, there is no pitching. It's all content. It's for free. It's the best stuff and it, that we can possibly produce. And it all 100% comes out of a direct experience producing content and getting results from content for ourselves and the ton of clients we now work with. Excuse my language. That's okay. And there you have it. Alexi has demonstrated the five-stage framework in what he just said. He said that if your 
ready to do business with him, then you can organize to work with him in a managed service type situation. But if you're not at that stage, if you're in the unaware stage or the problem aware stage probably, then you can just subscribe to his email list or check out content on his website. You, your actions speak as loud yeah. as your words. <laughs> I don't even realize that, I don't even realize I, I love do it. it anymore. The amount of times people have said to me, hey man, you speak like you write copy. And I go, well, yeah. <laughs> Two decades nearly of it. Yes. It's unconscious. Yeah. I love it. Thanks for being on the show, man.